There were many movements, many diverse goals, um, largely focusing on what we might call liberal, um, liberal feminism, groups like NOW and NARAL, groups that engage in electoral politics. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say modern feminism. Um, so this had been in a very important nucleus uh, or center of modern feminism, and you could see in you know, representatives of the Democratic Party, party like Bella Abzug, Shirley Chisholm in New York State, you could see the state party really migrating from that party of the New Deal to modern feminism really well in that state over the course of the 1970s. Meanwhile, on the other side, what better place to study the breakdown of the Rockefeller coalition than Rockefeller's home state? <laughs> um, that was where he served as governor from 1959 until he was brought into the White House as VP under Ford. Um, as governor of New York State in 1970, he very vigorously championed New York's state abortion reform law in 1970. New York State legalized abortion uh, three years before Roe versus Wade in what became the most expansive law in the nation. So most states had residency requirements. Uh, California could get an abortion. Ronald Reagan signed that bill in 1967 before abortion was part of the conservative agenda. But you had to be a resident of California to get an abortion there. So obviously um, establishing residency when you're on a tight time frame, it's not always possible, but New York State with the backing of Rockefeller, had passed a bill in 1970 whereby there were no residency requirements. So New York became very much a, a center where women from all around the country would go to have legal and safe abortions. So you go from the Republican Governor Rockefeller and uh, who ran the state party, championing many um, modern feminist political aims, the ERA, legal abortion, to 10 years later, um, Reagan makes it, I know, maybe I don't have to tell people in this room, but it's always a surprise to, uh, to me or to my students that New York was perhaps the number one swing state in the 1980 election. Of course, now it's never, we're never swing states in this area, right? But Reagan, um, with good reason, decided that if he could win the home of what had been moderate Rockefeller Republic, Republican politics, um, if he could win in this, the home state of Rockefeller, then conservatives will have, would have fully triumphed over the moderate wing in their party. Um, so, he, his campaign manager came from New York, Bill Casey from Long Island. In fact, his entire Northeast coordinator was a New Yorker. You may have heard of him. His name is Roger Stone. <laughs> he was, um, you know, he's a New Yorker. He's so really like a real attention to New Yorkers in that 80 campaign because he's going after it vigorously in terms of leadership, etc. Um, so imagine from 1970, the home of um, Rockefeller, where the state is supporting legal abortion because it's consistent with you know, Republican affinity for individual rights in a smaller state, to 10 years later, it's the number one swing state that the conservatives have set their eye on. So I just had to dig in, you know, what, how did that happen? How did you get women from the New Deal coalition who were committed Catholics and interested in poverty and social justice, new, um, how do you get them leaving the party of the New Deal at the same time that feminists are coming into the party, and how do you get them going over to the conservative wing of the Republican Party, Hoover's old wing? These are FDR Democrats, the opposite of Herbert Hoover and conservatives. And as it turns out, issues like abortion and the modern women's movement was very crucial to that migration. The same sentiment I had seen at the doors in Rhode Island, women who voted, you know, were willing to look past the Republic, conservative Republicans' um, ideas about poverty, which were very much the opposite of their own ideas about um, the need to tend to the poor, and look past that in favor of issues like abortion. This is where I was going to figure it out, I decided. Um, uh, essentially, what I really looked at in this book and dissertation were women who lived in the suburbs of New York. And I'm going to explain how they go from New Deal Democrats living in the boroughs of New York City to suburban, eventually conservative Republican voters. Um, 
giving the talk in this area, um, you are familiar with the suburbs of New York. It's Nassau and Suffolk County, on Long Island, Rockland County, and Westchester County, right? Very familiar to us here. Um, these suburbs explode after World War II with um, new white suburbanites who backed by um, you know, redlined mortgages from the GI Bill are finally able to you know, leave status as renters in the city and become suburban homeowners, right? Um, and th these are the families that the women I'm talking about come from. And that new, the women I talk about who will become these family values Catholic women, they are first generation suburbanites. And this is very important, first generation homemakers. Meaning they tended to be born around the 1930s in New York City. Their mothers worked, so did their fathers, to make ends meet during the Depression. Uh, they were generally, um, grew up in ethnic neighborhoods that were all, everything was oriented around their parish. Real cradle to grave system. They went to Catholic schools there. Um, they probably lived in extended families. A lot of their grandmothers would watch them while their mothers went out to work. And they were told, of course, as women, that the goal is to be a homemaker. Well, and that was making it. Well, alas, after World War II, they have made it. And of course, they think on their own, but really it's because their, part, their families are now considered white, their husbands often serve in World War II or Korea, and um, a lot of them have GI mortgages that make it so that continuing to rent in the same Brooklyn neighborhood where they grew up, a lot of them grew up in Park Slope, which back then was not the Park Slope of today. It was an Italian working class Catholic neighborhood, um, not the uh, fancy neighborhood of today. Um, but a lot of them grew up in places like Park Slope in these working class neighborhoods where their parents had pictures of, on the one hand, the Pope framed, and on the other hand, FDR. Because the New Deal was the, um, was really theirs were the families that were being lifted out of the most dire um, aspects of poverty during the Great Depression because of these New Deal programs. And it's in this moment that the Catholic Church and the Democratic Party are so intertwined. Um, a pope writes an encyclical in the early 1930, um, right, basically the Catholic Church had been concerned with anti-poverty measures for mostly its entire existence, but it really ramped up in the late 19th century with the onset of industrial capitalism, the Gilded Age, the first one, where you get incredible wealth, a hallowing out of the middle class, and then, you know, um, immigrants working in the factories that are enriching men like um, Carnegie, who are becoming the nation's first billionaires. Starting in the 19th century, the Catholic Church became vigorously committed to routing out the worst vestiges of industrial capitalism and addressing poverty. Democratic Party was not paying attention. <laughs> uh, but when, in the midst of a global depression, the Democratic Party starts paying attention and starts um, to form an agenda that is really committed, just like the Catholic Church, to anti-poverty programs. So sometimes untangling, um, you know, Catholicism and democratic politics in the 1930s in a place like New York, it's almost impossible. Uh, the church would build things only with unionized labor that Democratic Party leaders um, you know, recommended. Uh, this was really their world. They were New Deal Democrats and they were Catholics, and what I'm kind of saying is that it's almost one and of the same. <laughs> um, so that's their world, and a lot changes for them as they come of age. Their husbands are back to the GI mortgage. They're able to move to the suburbs um, along with other newly ascendant white middle class. It's the largest middle class our country will ever have in the post-war moment. About 60% of Americans are classified as middle class in the 1950s, but it's an engineered middle class. It's entirely white, expanded definition of who's white now. Now their families, these women, the Italians, Catholics, um, they are now considered white. Uh, so it's, it's, but you know, it's an entirely by design white middle class backed by mortgage programs that are inherent in the GI Bill. So these women move out of the cradle to grave neighborhood in places like Park Slope where their entire life was oriented around democratic politics and the Catholic Church. And they find themselves often not knowing how to drive and suddenly living in suburbs like Levittown. 
Here they are. Um, there's so many Catholics who move to these counties with their GI mortgages and other FHA mortgages that the Catholic Church doesn't know what to do. Here's a picture of a Catholic Church a mass that's being held in a tent on Long Island. There's the population of the Catholic Church can't keep up with the population of Catholics who are moving to these surrounding um, suburbs. And and what you have um, is, you know, these women who had this very, you know, cradle to grave system in the city. Suddenly, they find themselves really isolated in the suburbs. Many of them don't know how to drive. They've arrived in the suburbs, not needing to know how to drive, coming from the city. They're living in sort of, um, they're living in neighborhoods clustered together, homes very closely clustered, clustered together, and they don't know anyone. Gone is their support system. Gone is the extended family. And what they do find themselves is home during the day with a community of women just like themselves. They just don't know them. So one woman described it as, it was like we transferred the city to Rockland County. I just didn't know any of them, but I knew I knew them. We all had the same story. Um, this is the beginnings. It's a very unsettling time for them, right? They're torn away from their support system, but they immediately look, of course, to the Catholic Church for some grounding, for something familiar. Except this is not the parish that they uh, they're used to in the city. They're you know in a tent. <laughs> um, Compounding the problem, and, and what this really their everyday family life is a little unnerving as they move to the suburbs. They don't know anyone, it's a new lifestyle, and even what should be familiar, the Catholic Church isn't. And this is kind of a primer for how they're going to anticipate modern feminism. They see this, they, they, expect, they think of this as a disruption to everyday family life in the same way they're going to later talk about feminism. And I'll sort of um, unpack that a little bit for you. Because it's not just what they're contending with or not just a population explosion of Catholics. The Catholic Church even has to create a new diocese on, of Rockville Center on Long Island. This is also the 1960s when they arrive in the suburbs. And it seems the whole Catholic Church to them has changed with the onset of Vatican II. Almost every daily routine that they knew in Catholic life has been transformed. They're used to Latin masses. It's now going to be in English. A lot of the, um, so the Vatican II was an attempt in the early 60s to modernize the Catholic Church, make it more updated with um, everyday life for modern citizens. So they reasoned most Americans didn't, most um, Catholics all across the world didn't speak Latin, so it didn't make sense to do the mass in Latin anymore. There were all these devotional ceremonies that people just kind of did, but didn't know why you were doing it. So they tried to replace it with um, community groups, like, like this maybe in a Catholic church, where you would you know, um, be a member of a parish, and you would talk, you would maybe have um, different activities with the parish members, you would talk about current events from the perspective of being Catholic, rather than just, you know, doing devotional ceremonies to saints that no one really understood why they were doing it. So um, the women did not greet, they did not take this well, the women I, I, was, um, I was writing about, because it was just too unsettling for them. It was just too unsettling. Their lives had changed dramatically from city to suburb. And you layer this on top, all of a sudden there are all these new rituals that they have to do on the Sunday Mass that are different. And who do the Catholic priests reach out to to teach their families how to perform in the new Mass? These women. <laughs> um, so they feel like they are really like the person who has to bring this whole new Catholic lifestyle to their families. And they really feel like it's a, a gross disruption to everyday life. And the way, as I was saying, they will later talk about modern feminism as a disruption to everyday family life is really informed by this experience. That is, they would say, feminism was really bad, but you know, before that, Vatican II was just as bad. So this really like primed them to start thinking about defending institutions, traditional family institutions, and traditional family life. It was a, a good primer later on for feminism for them. Okay. Um, 
Also, as they so it's unsettling, but there are some good things to living in the suburbs. For the first time, money isn't as big of a concern for them. So though the Catholic Church talks a lot about a commitment to anti-poverty programs, poverty is really invisible to them by the time they're in the suburbs for a while. Um, everyone around them is a uniform middle class. They don't, they don't see poverty. And um, what they become committed to is this middle class lifestyle. They feel like they've finally made it. Okay, so there's like some unsettling things going on. Even the familiar institution of the Catholic Church has changed. But on the other hand, they're surrounded by other first generation suburbanites, other first generation homemakers. And whereby their mothers had to work in the factories in the 1930s, they've finally achieved the American dream for their family as a housewife. Okay, and that's really how they saw it. They saw it as like a prize. So, along comes in their state, they're living in the suburbs of New York City. They get their TV from the local, they get their news from local news, which is New York City based. And as we're getting into the 60s and 70s, it's really a, a center of modern feminism. So all of a sudden, um, they're watching TV and they're watching Democrats, the party of the New Deal, is now being represented by the likes of Bella Abzug, Shirley Chisholm, and they start to like, get a little skeptical about their former Democratic Party, right? Um, they were very, they were totally fine with the first major policy proposal of, that came to into the news and into their lives, Eat the Equal Pay Act of 1963, because they said women belonged at home, but if they have to work, they should have equal pay for equal work. Remember, they're the daughters of, in many cases, factory workers, and they think it would have been nice if mom had been paid as well as dad. Of course, if you can make it like we have, that's the ideal, but if you have have to work, you should have equal pay for equal work. And their, their Catholic Church is on board with that too. In fact, the Catholic Church supports equal pay for equal work um, if a family wage isn't attainable. So that is to say, if a breadwinner, a male breadwinner cannot support the family, they would hope that women who do have to work have equal pay for equal work. So this is perfectly consistent, the first iteration of, the modern, of modern feminism, equal pay for equal work, their church is on board, and they're on board. It's just not something they have to address because they've finally made it. But then along comes abortion, um, and they re this really, they, they weren't paying attention to politics in the 1960s. They may have seen feminists on the TV talking about equal pay for equal work, but a lot of them are Catholics, um, young mothers. They have upwards of seven children or more. They, they um, don't believe in artificial forms of birth control, just like their church. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm the mother of two young kids. I can relate like, to them not having time to watch politics or pay attention, really, because they're just busy. Um, they were very busy, but they weren't too busy to find out about abortion as that came around. I'm trying to get a handle on this. It's going a little too quickly for me. There we go. Oh, this is where I want to keep it. Um, okay, so remember I told you the Catholic Church had been trying to modernize itself with Vatican II, and the women didn't love it um, because it came at a time when they were just generally unsettled and craving some of that tradition. But as part of that, uh, the Catholic Church had created community groups that were supposed to take the place of some of these you know, rituals to different saints. And one parish on Long Island had decided to create a, um, what do I want to say, current events group. It was called a dialogue group, and it would be led by the Catholic uh, priest at the parish, and he would talk during the day, which was convenient to him, to parishioners about events in the news, and sort of have a discussion about how they should feel about these events um, as Catholics. Of course, these group, this group meeting during the day, it largely attracted the women, and only the women I talked about, um, who would join this group, and that would be the basis for the New York State Right to Life Party that they would form. Okay? Um, so they find themselves, other young mothers, their children are generally of school age, so they now have, they might have seven children, but they're all in school during the, during the day, just hit, hit them sort of at that um, point in their life cycle. 
And they start meeting with this priest, and they find out that in New York State, the state legislature, this is the late 60s, is debating legalizing abortion. Now, they see this as Catholics. Their, their church is telling them that this is akin to murdering someone out of utero. So they're opposed to it uh, because they're sort of being led to believe it's... Um, it's murder by their church, but many of them feel sincerely that it is murder. Um, these are women who kind of, their whole life was dedicated to full-time motherhood. That was seen as the prize for women. And what the way that they're perceiving it is that this is something that is backed by people who want to um, stop women from becoming mothers. They see motherhood and full-time motherhood as the prize, and they believe that it's just too disorienting for the way that they think about motherhood and really their selves, right? Um, this would potentially stop motherhood. And their church says it's murder. So they are against this for both, I think, personal reasons. It becomes clear when I've interviewed a lot of these women. Uh, by the way, this book is based on over 100 interviews with these women in New York State. And I got their names and contact information from Phyllis Schlafly, who is, of course, one of the leading um, anti-feminist leaders. Yes, she would. Uh, imagine being a graduate student and having your first ever interview be with Phyllis Schlafly. <laughs> so that's where I found myself in 2007. Um, I was saying interviewing her in 2007 was no different than reading her anti-feminist newsletters from the 1970s. It was the same dialogue. However, what was incredibly helpful to her is she said, oh, you want to meet activists I worked with in New York State during the 1970s? Let me just open up the Eagle Forum database, the current one, and that's how I found these women. Um, you know, approaching conservative family values.